Hey everyone, welcome back to the National Fire Radio podcast where we are releasing daily episodes Monday through Friday. Conversations with people that are in love with this job. We talk about the highs and the lows and everything in between. But if you're here listening and part of the National Fire Radio community and you're checking out this podcast, whether it's your first episode or you're all the way in on a hundred and something episodes by now and you're bought into it, we appreciate you. We appreciate you being part of the community and constantly coming back and listening to the podcast. Welcome. Enjoy the word. And for us to be able to do this and deliver this to you every day, we need the help of some sponsors. And these sponsors are partners where we do collaboration work and they allow us to put forth great content with great guests so that we can keep pushing this job forward. So before we hop into the episode, a quick word from some of our sponsors. Taylor's Tins. Taylor and his team have been manufacturing aluminum helmet fronts since 2017 with over 200,000 shields in the market. Taylor's Tins is a leader in the American Fire Service helmet front space. Not only do they manufacture helmet fronts, but they do so much more. Locker tags, key chains, CO monitor charts, medical kit charts, pump charts, banquet awards, you name it, they do it. Go over to taylorstins.com and check out what they can offer you today. They've become a longtime sponsor and good friend of the National Fire Radio podcast, and because of that, they offer a promo code at checkout. So when you go to taylorstins.com, enter NFR sent me. That is NFR sent me, and you'll get 15% off your checked out order. It works on all stock items from taylorstins.com, including quick tins, license plates, locker tags, and much, much more. Exclusions do apply. This is a company that prides themselves on quality and customer service. From the inception, from your design to out the door, it's within 48 hours. Nobody else is doing that. They can't do that. 48 hours to get your shield out the door to you to put it on your helmet and get to the next job. Anyway, check out taylorstins.com. Again, that's taylorstins.com. Check out their latest offerings and use promo code NFR sent me. That's NFR sent me for 15% off on your checkout. And in the words of Taylor and his crew, stop burning up leather. Hey everyone, Jeremy National Fire Radio. Welcome back to the podcast this morning. A very, very special guest. A guy that, that believed in us from very early on. He was our first speaker when we started our On Tap series years ago that COVID destroyed and we need to get back to it. Uh, where we took over breweries or bars and we brought in a speaker and over some brotherhood and camaraderie, they taught a good word. Captain Nick Papa out of New Britain, Connecticut. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. It's good. it's good to be back. It is uh, it is fun. I think this is probably your second or third time. I think your third time if we include the one phone conversation, maybe even more than that. But we've done a lot of things together. Um, I saw you very early on years ago through the New England Fools. I saw you do your presentation on coordinating ventilation. Um, and I was very impressed with it because I think the one thing that people need to know about Nick Papa is about how dialed in you are. The amount of research and data that you dive into to make sure that your message is loud and clear and truthful to the point that there's it's bulletproof. Um, I just know how you are. You're methodical, and, and you deliver on very good content. And uh, you really impressed me up in, uh, at the New England Fools event years ago, and that's why I wanted to get you in as one of our first speakers for the On Tap. Plus, it was a topic, Nick, that many people don't talk about, ventilation, right? It's, it's one of the staples of the fire ground, and yet we don't consider it a primary objective. Basically, it's like secondary to search and fire attack, no? Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's still a topic that's not really talked much about. And, you know, with, uh, there's been a lot of good stuff going on lately with, with, with the different studies yeah. and the different movements that have been going on between, you know, fire attack and, and now search, especially with the, the grassroots movement from, you know, the firefighter rescue survey, yes. and the, the, uh, the master's project that uh, chief brush did, which is all, I mean, phenomenal. I mean, it's allowing us to, to really, you know, quantify the, the greatest thing that we do as firefighters, which is to save lives and, you know, giving us the, the metrics to, to, you know, prove our worth and to go to the table to ask for more resources and more staffing. And so that's, you know, I hate, I always hate, I hate to say this, but it's like, that's where the, the, the law enforcement community, that's where they, they beat us is with, with the data collection. Yes. I know it's not, it's not the sexy topic and, you know, not fun, you know, that fun to talk about, but this is where we really get to, to show 
what we're capable of and why we need the staffing numbers that we need and the resources that we need. Because um, when we go to sit down at the table and you know you're trying to justify it to the bean counters, like they want to see you know hard facts and data, and that's where these the, the, these guys like Chief Brush and yeah you know, the the whole group from Firefighter Rescue Survey is doing such a huge service to the uh, to the firefighting community by by getting this going and bringing so much attention to it. But that's you know that, that those are the things that people like to talk about because that's the the exciting part of the job and. Yeah, you know, that's the, the, th the thrilling piece. I mean, see, you know, the, the greatest, you know, honor or the greatest you know, thing that you could do as a firefighter is, a, you know, saving, a, uh, saving somebody's life or, you know, the, 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 the knobs, the job, as they, as they say. So, you know, the fire attacks, the, the, the exciting part, the other exciting part of the job where ventilation is that, that support function. It's the, what are those, those, those things that if, you, if you're strapped for, for, for resources, you know, you, you focus on those those two primary objectives, and that's kind of the first one to to fall victim to you know that triaging of the tactics, if you will. If yeah. you can't do them all, because um, unfortunately, not everybody has the the luxury of of ample staffing to to get a lot of these functions done simultaneously. So, ventilation is one of those things that that gets uh, it's the first one to get cut off or or to be addressed later uh, later on. So it um, it, it's not always the, the the primary focus, so that was one of the things. And you know, being a, a, an engine company officer for the bulk of my career, which uh, we'll we'll address that one right out of yeah. the gate. It's it's so funny because when people hear that I teach ventilation, they automatically assume, oh, you know, you're a truck guy. You teach on you know opening up roofs. It's like no, that's that's not. You know, you've sat through the class. I think I've got like one slide on <laughs> on, on cutting, and it's yeah. not even a how to. It's you know when when are we when are we cutting and you know when does it have value? The whole class is on on the coordination piece of it, which when you think about it, you know who's the person that's you know confirming or requesting ventilation on a consistent basis, and who's you know that that guaranteed benefactor of the ventilation? It's the engine, co it's the nozzle team. Well, who who uh, reaps the benefits of it, right? I right. mean, you know, and that's exactly it. As an engine company boss, you know that well placed and, and well positioned and well timed ventilation makes your push that much easier to get full extinguishment or at least containment right. and control, right? And I think I think it should be said too that you know as as we as ventilation takes a back seat to the other two primary functions on the fire ground without well done and well placed ventilation and well timed the other two tasks uh, could potentially become near impossible at times and so you know it's it's definitely something that I think requires more of a focus than we give it. Um, and I know that you are bringing that to light and through your uh, the classes that you teach, as well as your book that you wrote, Coordinating Ventilation, the Supporting Extinguishment and Survivability. I mean, it says it right in the title, The Importance of Ventilation. Um, it should be said to just I did your intro real quick. 20 years fire service, 15 and a half years on the line with New Britain, Connecticut, second generation. You write nationally for the trade publications. You speak nationally. You have a training company, Fireside Training. Um, and you sat on the uh, you were an active participant on the UL study for coordinated fire attack. I mean, your plate's full and you love data and research, which I find um, I it's funny to me in a, in a good way. And I mean that, and I'll explain why you today, your position today is much different than it was just not too long ago, meaning that you've taken on a new position within your department that has really opened you up to everything you just talked about stat uh, stats, you know, the statistics, the data, the importance of administration, all of that, right. Educating our own. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing today, Nick, because I think it looks a lot different than what you were doing not too long ago. Yeah, the, the things took a, <laughs> it took a hard left. So I had uh, my uh, my road to captain has been a a very windy, bumpy one. And a, I'll tell you what, it's one of the things that um, really they, they, that means the most to me is that um, showing my kids that. You know, no matter what life throws at you, no matter how many disappointments that you get, um, you just got to keep plowing forward. That's and right. uh, this was uh, the, the third the third time was a charm. You know, it was I, I blew the doors off the, you know, every every oral exam that I took and you know, scored really high on the written exams. But I'll tell you what, um, my job's full of, of some, you know, some studs and the, the competition is always steep. 
Um, and it just, I would miss the mark by, by a hair uh, at, at every time. And uh, I'm sitting number one on the line captain's list right now, but we have uh, an administrative captain's position as well uh, called the captain of planning and research, which yeah. is essentially you're, you're the, the XO to the fire chief. So the, that job reports directly to the fire chief and you're kind of the, it's funny that it's, it's going to make me seem like I'm trying to make the job seem cool, but uh, you're basically the, the administrative free safety. So anything, <laughs> anything that, uh, that, that kind of spills over or requires additional effort from, you know, the chief or the, or the, the, the ops chief, you're basically kind of, you know, filling in and supplementing, you know, the, the sure. those guys in the execution of some of those administrative functions and, you know, getting involved with strategic planning and grant writing. And so it's uh, it's entirely different job. So that, that position became va vacant uh, because it's a, it, it's a, it's now since our last contract, a separate tested position. So it was, uh, it was look, looking like I was going to get pulled up on the line captain's list, but the, uh, the, the, chief, the chief's position that had gotten filled, which would have created backfilled my position and pulled me up, um, the, the guy who got promoted uh, it w came out of this job, so it didn't create the, the, the line company spot. Yeah. So I ended up, I ended up taking, uh, taking this, this third test and you know, came out number one and ended up uh, taking the job. And it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a, you know, been a wild couple of months because when I got the promotion, I was actually detailed into uh, the, the fire academy because we actually just, we built the training facility last year and we and ended up running our own fire academy. Nice. We had 11, uh, 11 recruits that, that came through and it's, uh, you know, this necessity is the, uh, the mother of innovation and we uh, it, it had been something that we had been wanting to do for a long time, but just had never been pushed or never had you know pulled the pin on it. And we ended up getting our our, our hand forced because we had eleven spots to, that needed to be filled, and the Connecticut Fire Academy happened to be very saturated this uh, this last go around, and their uh, recruit class was already up to to over seventy, and they could only guarantee us four slots. Oh wow! So, yeah, so we ended up having to just you know, bite the bullet and do it. And, you know, to, uh, to the credit of, uh, our chief and assistant chief, um, they, the, the chief had the, had the vision to do it. And, you know, the, the assistant chief told them we could do it and we, they, they we just ran with it. And it, uh, it was a very, it was probably one of the, like the thing I'm, I'm proudest most about, you know, about my you know, time with new Britain is just the, not only did the administration have the faith in you know the their personnel to get it done but they let us do it uh that was the other thing too i mean that's you know to to, not, to have that level of, of of faith from from above and the support from above to be able to execute something to this magnitude uh was was tremendous and it i'll tell you what this is where i, I we had talked in the pre-show where i wanted this this to go was you know, there's so much value in, you know, running your own fire academy for, from not only are you teaching guys your way right from the get out, but it's, you want to talk about indoctrinating, you know, your, your recruits, your new firefighters uh, into the, 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 the philosophy and, and the culture and mindset that sure. you want them to have. I mean, you're, you're literally, you're, you're creating that mold right from the beginning. Uh, and so it's, you know, the, you get, you get to, to, to instill in them exactly what you want from day one. And it's the, it's been just a tremendous experience and it's, uh, it's one that I'll definitely, uh, you know, hold uh, near and dear to my heart. I mean, that's, the, I'll tell you what, it's, that's probably what been one of the most transformative and impact, impactful experiences I've had throughout my career. Just wow. From, yeah. From, from mul multiple levels. Not, I mean, from, you know, uh, the you know the leadership experiences the you know develop, you know fostering culture and then even just you know my imp you know improvement and development as an instructor too because you know you're you're it I mean from you you got to make it work from 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 A to Z and from the the lecture to the hands on to the the logistics and the, the execution it's you got to make it happen. So it was, uh, uh, we, we were, I was blessed to be able to work with some 
in, incredible people and you know we really had the the murderers row of of, of instructors that that stepped up to, to make this happen and that was uh that was really and, the best of this and to have the administration staff that allowed you guys to put together a program that represents the very best of what you wanted to bring forth as new britain fire department right now 11 well, I, 11 recruits is that a is that the large i mean it, your job isn't overly big right like how many guys do you have we're 130. Okay, so 11 guys is uh, it's a pretty good number, I would think, for you guys to put on at one shot, no? Yeah, the, the, um, I think my class was probably the, the, the biggest class in the last probably 20 years. We had 16 in ours, but okay. you know, typically we wind up bringing in anywhere from a half dozen to a dozen guys at a clip. Yeah, and then w having the ability, right, because this is the first time that you guys have done this in-house, you had the ability from the get – to create a program that represents the very best of what you guys wanted to do, right? How was there, was there a hard, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of work, a lot of back end stuff that has to go into that, right? The logistics of it, the planning of it, the writing, the program, the study guides, all that stuff, right? Because if you were using the Connecticut F State Fire Academy, right? They had that program dialed in basically, and it was much more vanilla to New Britain because it can't hit on the specifics. For you guys to design and build your own program from the get, you can take ownership right away, right? Was it difficult to get the buy-in from other people about how important this opportunity was? Oh, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Because I mean, it's it's just like everywhere else. You you know, you've got people that just will will buck the system yeah, when right. it comes to anything to do with change or, or progress, uh, and it's just they'll they'll fight it. So of course we had we had the naysayers and the people that were you know were were fighting it tooth and nail. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, the, the train just moves, you know, right. and it, you know, again, luckily we had some, you know, some pretty big impact players that were, were involved in the program. And uh, it just, it, it, things kept materializing. And I don't think, I don't think people realized it was actually going to happen or it, when it did happen, that it was going to be to the magnitude that it was um, that this, you know, this, well, this wasn't some, you know, rinky dink or, you know, uh, you know, Bush league uh, type, type uh, program. Right. I and mean, we really, we really turned the screws to these recruits and, and gave them some, some seriously hard, you know, hard training. I mean, we didn't, we didn't let off the gas pedal, you know, one, okay. one little bit from, you know, that the lecture to the hands-on right to, to the PT aspect of it. I mean, we, we really, you know, push them to the, to the limits to, you know, get, you know, the, really show them that, you know, this, this job is all mindset. Yeah. It's yeah, all the, mindset. The buy-in then is got to be tenfold, right? When you can do it in-house, not only do, when you start to see the results of, of your own tutelage on these uh, candidates or probies that are coming through your system now, right? And you control it from A to Z. Not only do you start to get the buy-in from those that are that maybe were the naysayers from from the get, right? To those that are starting to see the the progress and why it matters and the culture and the way these guys now are prepared to walk in on their first day, it's very different than going to that vanilla academy that can't dial in on the culture and traditions of the New Britain Fire Department, right? Because you guys can now create a program that basically tells them how and what to expect within your own firehouses, right? Usually that's, yeah, I mean, usually that's done after these guys come back, right? And then it's like, okay, everything you just learned, great. That's the fundamentals. Now we have to teach you our own department, but you guys can do that along the whole process. Exactly. And it, it, we, it, it, it's been a tremendous cost savings for, for yeah. the city as well because the Connecticut Fire Academy's program is up to 16 weeks now. And when they come out, we, we still have to train them for another month yeah. because we have to do the first responder, you know, medical certification, which takes a, a couple of weeks. And then we need to do another couple of weeks to teach them our way. Cause you know, we have our specific hose loads and we throw ladders a certain way, and ca uh, catch hydrants a certain way. So it's another couple of weeks of, of us indoctrinating them into our strategy and tactics and our equipment. So when all is said and done, you're looking at 20 to 21 weeks before they can hit the street where now we did everything lock stock in 14 weeks. Yeah, that's cool. So it's, you're looking at that six weeks of cost savings and overtime. And I mean, that alone is, is massive. Not, not to mention this, this first go around, you know, we saved the, the overtime costs of, uh, of seven, 
seven firefighter vacancies for close to a year because by mm. you look at how long it would have got it taken us to catch all 11 of those those recruits yeah have, uh, to go through a second cycle of the academy it would have just been into the hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah what did it do for you and the instructor staff i mean for you you travel nationally you've sat on different panels and boards you teach um you've written books i mean you're very dialed in with the training aspect of it so this must have been a nice change of pace for you to put hands on to your own guys within your own department i would think right for sure and it, it um the probably the, the greatest part about this whole program is watching the the guys that had an interest in teaching yeah. uh, to, to see them step up and cool. see guys they see guys that are that are into the job that want to take that next step, that want to get involved, um, but you know, especially the the guys that are at the privates rank or the you mm-hmm. know the, uh, the the drivers rank, that maybe not don't have the the day to day opportunity to to get in uh, get involved on that formal right. of a level to see those guys step up and to really shine and and you know see their their passion you know bubble to the surface, and it was that was the the, the most incredible part of the whole process was seeing the development of, of the other guys and, you know, you know, seeing how much passion there, there really is lurking beneath the surface that when given the opportunity and allowed to, to be in, or given the environment to, to be able to, to really let that out was, was just so gratifying. And then it was also, you know, it, 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 it gives you that, that feeling of optimism too, that, Hey, there's, there's uh, there's a lot more people that are that are into the job than than they than they lead on or you know there's I think the big thing is people just need to be given opportunity yeah and once they they have that opportunity they realize hey this it's it's okay for me to be into the job it's mm-hmm. uh, you know it's that that that, that TK line it's okay to yeah. love the job and I think that's where a, a lot of it is the culture aspect of it you know the I don't in a lot of a lot of places and you know ours is no different it's in some firehouses there's that mindset or that culture has developed that you know it's almost uh it's almost cool to 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 not, not like yeah. the job or to not be in, in into the job it's right. that that whole like tough guy counterculture bravado of uh, mm-hmm. like, uh, just acting like you don't care sure it's everywhere um, yeah and it's it's ridiculous. So right. you, you get a lot of those guys that are kind of caught in between where, you know, they want to, they, they want to do the right thing. They want to, you know, they are into the job and they want to, uh, you know, bring that passion to the, uh, to the forefront. But, you know, for whatever reason, it's, it's being stifled or they don't, you know, they don't feel like they can really let that out where now this gave them the outlet to do so. Yeah. And, and the, great to see. the fact that, you know, a job of 130 can only offer so many opportunities to its people. Right. And that's the mm-hmm. thing. I think opportunity is super important. And then it's up to the individual if they want to capitalize on any opportunity given. Right. And so for you guys now to open up a whole new lane of opportunity and maybe getting others involved in the process. Man, that buy-in just from those those members that are on the job already, you give them a little more opportunity to shine or to do a little bit more. And what they bring back to the firehouse after feeling fulfilled and satisfied from teaching for a day at the academy and that maybe your best chauffeur on the job is recognized for that because you've asked him to come speak to the the candidates, right? Like, it, it's just – it's that informal but formal – like a uh, way of promoting and boosting one another up. I love it, man. Opportunity is important. And the great thing was, is we, it's exactly as you said, we got to really showcase the guys Hell yeah. and, and, and their talents. Yes. So when it came to, you know, the uh, vehicle extrication, one of, one of my uh, dear friends who I worked alongside when I was on engine one, he was the latter one officer who's in, in my, my eyes, you know, one of, one of the, the best, best firemen on our job. And, you know, if I was still a private, he'd be the guy I'd want to work for us. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we brought John Toronto in to, to teach extrication and, you know, just to stand back and watch him That's just cool. run. And, you know, this, this guy just oozes passion and, and for, and for the job and, you know, just to have these, these recruits have their first, um, introduction with vehicle extrication with a guy like like John. Yeah. It, what more could you ask for? And right. then same thing when it came to search. 
you know, one of our, our senior lieutenants who spent the bulk of his career between the ladder and our rescue company, you know, they got to learn from, from Mike Sanzaro and, you know, a guy that's, that's, you know, been involved in rescues before and that sure. has tremendous amount of search experience. And he loves, loves that, that, tr that truck and rescue work. So it's, it's a, just incredible to be able to put people in those positions where they get to, um, to share their passion, to share their experiences and then the recruits get uh, get to eat that up. I mean, that's that it's a it's a win win. You can't ask for a, a better learning environment for to have a, an instructor that that wants to be there, that has the pedigree to to, yeah. to teach up what they're teaching about, and you know, then they, it just creates this this ideal atmosphere for them to to them to to learn and to you know progress into the job. So that yeah. that piece of it was was just invaluable you can't you really can't beat that well you just said something which which is a, a nice segue right you said learn and progress within the job well that's what you're doing now right yeah. i mean you are you've you've taken yourself uh off the street right other than like overtime shifts and getting back into the firehouse at least to ride when you can but right now you're you're more of an administrative uh, officer who's finding his way through the ins and outs of that side of the job. Talk to me a little bit about that transition, that personal decision to do that, because that's got to be challenging for you to remove yourself from what you absolutely love doing day in and day out to a different type of position. But you can also make your stamp there. And also that's where the learning comes in too, right? To learn the whole other side of the job. Talk to me a little bit about that mindset, making that decision to make that switch, and then what your duties and and what your what your day to day looks like today. So I'll tell you what, that, that was not an easy decision by any <laughs> means. Ah, I can. I'm sure. Oh my God. I'm sure. So let me. It, it, there was a lot of soul searching that that went on with this, and it, if you'd you know when you asked me a year ago that people are like, oh you you know you're going to take the take the planning and research captain test right. and I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Or if I do, it's only going to be for the testing experience just so I can get another, you know, another round of, you know, oral board experience. Sure. And, but then as it got closer and, you know, the, the future of that, the line captain's list is uncertain. I mean, I could certainly die number one on the, on the list and then, you know, nothing, you know, nothing would have happened. And then I, I, I was listening to a podcast and, you know, talking to somebody and, it uh, it hit me, and then it was funny. I, I listened to uh, a podcast with you know, Grant Schwalbe was on, and yeah. he was he was you know he had m made the move to to their op, uh, ops chief position, and you know he said it was you know he he felt it was was his obligation to to take take that make that personal sacrifice because you know it was for the betterment of the job. And, you know, it's, I looked at it was, I'm like, you know what, like I, I couldn't just, you know, ride out being the Lieutenant on engine one and, and have a blast doing it. And yes, I could have an impact from there, but you know, is this what's best for, for the job? Is this what's best for, for me and my family? And, you know, cause you know, of course you got to put all, put all of those factors into play too. And, you know, I realized that this would be a, a really good opportunity because, you know, we were unfortunate right now where our chief and assistant chief are, we, they're tr tremendous. And, you know, they've, they both have very different personalities and that complement each other really well. And um, I have developed a great uh, rapport with them, sure. especially, you know, being involved with the Academy and the planning with that. And, you know, they're just very mission oriented guys. And, uh, and they just, they're the type of people that if, if, you come to them with a problem and you have a solution ready, they're going to, as long as it's viable and it meets the mission of the job, they're going to tell you to run with it. Nice. You know, that, that that's the type of environment that they've bred where, you know, it's, it's everybody, everybody's got a problem, but not everybody has a solution. So when you, when you come to them with, with something that's going to make the job better, and as long as, as long as we've got the, the money to make it work, you know, they're going to let you run with it. So yeah. I, thought them like you know what what better way for me to not only keep pushing the uh, the ball forward but also you know to learn the different side of the job because you know I don't know where where the I, I want the end point for me to be and with the fire service you know it, it, you usually don't get the opportunity to learn the administrative side of the job until you hit that level and then you're forced to learn it on the job that's right 
you know, less than ideal, you know, it's, you're, you're trying to figure things out as you go along and, you know, hopefully you've got some sort of a, a mentor or you know, somebody to, to show you the ropes, but, you know, this was that rare opportunity to allow me to, to, to see what's behind the curtain, you know, if you will, and, and learn that administrative side of the job, uh, that way, if, if, you know, my, my career path leads me down that road, um, that I'm prepared for it. And, you know, I think and also, it, it provides you an opportunity to be more well-rounded, right? Like right. ultimately at the end of the day, you're making decisions on the line as a line captain, but you gotta, you gotta understand the repercussions of decisions on the street and how that funnels up through the, the process of decision-making when it comes to uh, planning and equipment and, and operations and all of that stuff. And I think that it makes you a much more well-rounded <laughs> officer and person to learn as much as you can. I talk a lot about being uncomfortable and uncomfortable is good. And you know, you said it, you said, Hey, I could have rode out being captain on the engine one and life was good, but you decided to make your life uncomfortable again by learning something new. I think it speaks volumes to the type of guy you are and and type of firefighter you are personally. So I'll tell you what, one of the, one of the best things that, that helped me kind of make peace with my decision was uh, one of my, my closest friends uh, who we came on together and, he actually, uh, his, his career path took a, a hard left and, um, you know, he ended up, uh, you know, leaving our job early and is, he's now in the midst of, of law school right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. It just, uh, guy was a former Marine, mm-hmm. just a total, total savage, uh, you know, one of, one of my you know, closest friends and he knew I was grappling with this, this whole thing. And, you know, out of the blue, he, I get a text message from him after the Academy ended and I was getting ready to actually start in, in the new job. And he uh, just, you know, just those those messages from yep. the people that mean the most to you always seem to appear at the right time. Love it, yeah. Well, he uh, this message comes in, and it's he's like, hey, you know, when when go into this new job with uh, with an open mind, and he said, just remember, because he knows I'm a big you know military buff, and sure. you know I do a lot of reading on on you know the military to. to pull a lot of those leadership lessons but so he says to me because remember even though the you know the most hardened you know combat veterans when they when they finish a tour of duty or some sort of a a, a long forward assignment most of them wind up spending a, a good chunk of time in staff roles afterwards he's like so just mm-hmm. remember that he goes and it's because it, it's it, it makes them a more well-rounded you know soldier or, sure. or marine or what have you so it's and it it's funny it's like as as much as uh you know I'm I'm into that the the military leadership side of things I never put those uh, connect those two dots or put those two pieces together and to just have him you know uh, recognize that that and you know pass that along was was just so That's impactful cool. just completely changed my mindset about uh, about the about the job and about the transition and. I, I do love when messages like that occur and it happens a lot to me in my world too. you know, a day that I'm struggling with something and I get a pick me up text or phone call or just somebody out of the clear blue that, you know, you haven't thought of or talked to in a while and it kind of just resets you. I mean, that, that stuff is priceless to me. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. So then your daily activities now, I mean, you, you get taken off the rotation, you put on straight days and now you're more in an administration and staff position what does that look like for you? I mean, are you finding fulfillment and en- I mean, truthfully, are you finding fulfillment and, and enjoyment in the other side of, of the of the firehouse? Oh, absolutely. So it, it's just it's it's different, but you know, you can. It's one of those jobs where you, you can you can make it what you want it, yeah, want it to be. Nice, as busy as you want to be, and with the, the AFG uh, grant cycle just at, coming to an end, we were full court press the last two weeks, you know, to get, you know, get our grant proposals in. And Good. so that, that, that was one of the, again, one of those things where, you know, fingers crossed, we, we, uh, we do well in, in, when they, they award the grants, but you know, that's where, you know, something we could have a, a massive impact on, on the future of the job because our, the grants that we put in for were, uh, we did a, a local grant for professional development, which is, you know, historically something that we, we haven't done just because of uh, financial constraints and you know the more we're now these federal grants will, will allow us to you know will hopefully allow us to to do that by providing those financial means to do so and we can really start building up the, the job and, and preparing people to move into you know those um, those roles as they as they go up the chain of command and you know that's that's really where 
you can make those significant changes. And it's not only providing guys with the credentials, but it's also, you know, we're, we put in for some supplemental classes to, to complement those, those certification courses where, you know, we put in for the, the fire dynamics boot camp and we put in for um, leadership under fires, you know, optimizing human performance class. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where I feel like you can, you can make some of the biggest changes and, you know, especially with the, the cadre of instructors that Jason Bresler's got working for sure. him. I mean, that, that's where you can have that, that massive impact where, you know, I look at that to me, that's where it, it really reaffirms my decision because again, you know, I, I was able to affect positive change at the company level, but now this is something that doesn't just affect, you know, my crew or my company. It's, you know, now this is something that's going to be hopefully impactful for the entire job for, for years to come. And that, that's where, again, you can have that, that more global impact. And how, how it. important is it in the position you're in right now to be dialed in with today's fire service culture, meaning podcasts, social media, knowing who's out there that's affecting change because not everyone is, uh, can be on the, the big national channels and not every great message is coming from those top 1% guys that teach. There's so much value in the resources that are out there through different conferences, different training courses, bring in speakers, podcasts. In the position you're in right now, and I know you're dialed in pretty much. I mean, you've mentioned a lot of different things today that are influencing or things that you listen to or have helped you make decisions. Grant Schwabe, the rescue, uh, the rescue uh, forum, all those things, right? How important is that in the position you're in today to help you make effective decisions that are representative of today's fire service? Oh, I think it's huge because so much of this this job, like like any other profession, is it's the networking uh, capacity. And that's where like platforms like this are, are so tremendous because you could get a guy that's in my position and you know pick a uh, pick a spot on the map, and that's where he's working, and you know you he finds himself in a not in a novel situation where you know there's somebody on one of your your podcast may have gone through that and now yeah. starts talking about it on the podcast and now he can you know, reach out to you and get in, uh, get in contact with that person. And it just provides, you know, people with that, uh, that vicarious, you know, mentorship or, um, or that opportunity to, to hear that the experiences of other people. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel or to, to go through these situations without any guidance. Cause you know, the one thing that I, I that I've noticed is, and it's been the case personally too at times, where you know that's you, you may not be in a position where you have that 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 mentor. And I know in a lot of places that there's, there's been a lot of turnover, and sure. you know, sounds like from a lot of podcasts that I've listened to, and you know, interacting with people at the the different conferences or events, and you know, a lot of people are saying the same thing that. Oh, our job's young, and we don't have any senior men, or there's you know not that many you know senior officers, and you know people are 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 looking for that that mentor. They're looking for that person to to show them the ropes and to to lead them the way and provide that guidance in those those novel or those difficult situations where platforms such as this gives people the the access to you know people that. Uh, that are willing to, that have experience, that are willing to share, you know, their, uh, that experience with others. And, you know, most of the people that are, you know, that are out there, you know, doing what we do, all of us are doing it for the same reasons. And, you know, because we love the job, because yeah. we want to make it better. And, you know, every one of us is more than willing to pick up the phone or, you know, answer a text or an email to, to help somebody out. And, yeah, you know, that's the the beauty of all this is you know you just the, the sharing of of information and experiences to, to to make the job better. But I also think like the importance of you dialing yourself in to to look for more about the job outside of when you have to, right? Like you're 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 dialed in and you're into the job to the point where you spend your spare time too digesting, learning, reading, dedicating time back to you know productive uh, things within the job. And you get to take all of that then and bring it back to in, in a in a planning and organization or a planning and research position. I it's it's invaluable to have a guy like yourself in that position because I think you can affect so much change. I really do. Well, I think the beauty of this is it's it's knowing what's out there, and I think that's what's 
I'm so fortunate that I'm able to to do what I do and yeah. interact with the folks that I do because I'm able to now bring that back where I think people don't a lot of a lot of people don't even realize what's out there for for resources or um we just kind of get insulated in our, in our own little bubble of, of our community or our region. And it's like, you don't even recognize the, what's going on, even, even within just outside your region. Yeah. So I think that's, it's just opening people's eyes to say, Hey, like there's, I mean, something as simple as the, the videos that the Elkhart brass put out the brass tax sure. hard fast videos. And you know, somebody like would ask a question about standpipe operations and, uh, they, they you know, asked me a, a question and I'm like, Hey, I'm like, there's a, there's a great video series out there. And I'd show them the website and they, Oh man, this is great. And they, they had you know, no clue it even existed. Right. So it's just a, it's something as simple as that, uh, of, you know, just pointing people in the right direction or, you know, knowing who to, who to bring in. I mean, again, there's so many tremendous instructors and, and training groups out there that offer, uh, some really uh, high level programs and you know it's ha half the battle is just knowing you know who to go to for for certain disciplines and the ability to to then reach out to those people and, and bring them in yeah. is it, i think it's i think that's half the battle oh, i agree and i think we need to do and this is partly of of what's important to me with our platform is being able to find and share different resources so that we make it easier for everyone to find what they need. I mean, there's, I think now more than ever, there's, there's, uh, you know, opportunity, but you have to go seek it out. And, um, and what, what's important to me is guys like you and myself who live this and, and we seek this out on a regular basis. We need to share how important that is with others that might be struggling a little bit because I think everybody can find an outlet or find what they're looking for for the most part. And sometimes it takes a guy like you or I to be that catalyst to make that to make that connection and say, hey, check this out. Go over here. Look at this Elkhart video. This, you know, you got some of the best instructors in the world putting their face on camera and explaining how it's done. So you can pick up incredible value just from that. And sometimes it takes somebody to be that conversationalist to, to make that bridge. But it's also on the individual. We need individuals to buy in to understand that there's a whole nother culture outside of their four walls. And how, I mean, encouraging them to go find that is so important. And, and people need to realize too that how much of an impact they can have. And again, it's even if it's just within the four walls of your firehouse on your crew, you can have such a tremendous yes. impact. I, I know it can be can be corny, but I always, you know, I had actually just had this conversation with uh, with with a, one of our guys the other day, and was kind of just voicing his frustrations about you know trying to you know move the needle forward. And I told him, I said. You just got to remember. Sometimes it's just like th it's throwing a rock in the pond. You know, it's like it. it you're that rock is still going to have have ripple effects, and yet it, you may only see the the immediate ripples after you throw it in. But make no mistake, those that that ripple is going to make its way across the entire pond eventually. But it's just it, pe people tend to get frustrated, and you know they they want to see that immediate change, or they want to yeah. see that something change, and they have to realize it's it's the long game. You know, it's with every person that you positively influence, that one per it's exponential. That one yes. person is gonna then take that mentality or take what they learned and pass that on to somebody else. And it just keeps on going. It's that and it has that ripple effect where you know that's what we we, we gotta remember. And it and it may take years for you to to have that for for that epiphany moment to really present itself where you get to see the fruits of your labors you know, years down the road. But and again, so like for me, one of those moments was uh, at the tail end of our academy. I think it was the last week we had uh, we had brought two of uh, two of our privates in to to give a a firehouse preparation class for the recruits. So that way, it was basically it was the inf it was the informal yeah. privates only. They, the, the guys were great. They actually awesome. came over and they asked me and uh, one of the lieutenants who was the other the other lead for the class. And he said, "Hey guys, like with all due respect, do you, do you mind leaving the room?" And they kicked us out, and they did their their whole their whole little private's expectation speech. And you know, two to three hours later, they they basically laid down the letter of, uh, awesome. of, the, of the law of what was to be expected of them as as new recruits and what they were going to be responsible for, and um, and how to conduct themselves in the firehouse. So that way, 
there was no excuses there there was you know they 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 knew what what uh how they had to to handle themselves when they got when they walked in the door on day one invaluable that's all that's, that's so powerful right i mean that's so cool i love so, and that then, and the great part was so two the, the two guys that that did it were you know two, two of the guys that that started their careers with with, with me on engine one so oh, that was awesome. that was so gratifying to see these guys um you know stepping up they you know they've since slid, slid across the floor to the the, the ladder and you know, I got to work with these guys for, for years and just can't say enough about them. But to see those guys, you know, step up and, and to now pass the torch on and, and set the next generation up for success. And, you know, one of the, one of the guys went so far as to, to put a whole packet together. It was all, you know, sectioned off and bulleted. And, you know, basically it, it gave a whole chronology of, of what they were supposed to do from, from you know, the, the, the handoff report for, at shift change all the way to, you know, desk watch procedures and how to handle yourself at mealtime and yeah, you know, that's awesome. and it's all the intangibles and the, the unwritten rules uh, of the firehouse that a lot of me, like I, I, it's all the stuff that I got myself into trouble as a probie for, for not doing or forgetting. Um, or, you know, you, you, a lot of the times it was, you get in trouble for it because nobody took the time to, to tell you you had to do it in the first place. So now this was, you know, uh, these guys setting the next generation up for success by 100%. completely preparing them uh, for, you know, what, uh, what we do in, in New Britain. I love that. I mean, it's so, it's so powerful because, you know, how do you, you can't get frustrated and upset and, and pissed off with our people if we don't set them up for success. Meaning, you know, if we don't give them a level of expectation and they and they fail on us, it's our fault, right? Because we didn't give them the expectation of what's expected. So I love that. I think those informal classes like that where, where you know, you got – hey, uh, Nick, could you hey, – Cap, would you mind stepping out of the room and we'll see you in three hours? Like, that's huge. That is yeah. huge because it also – it also speaks volumes to your command staff and to you and your guys where you respect your own people enough to say, yep, we'll remove ourselves from the equation. We understand the value in this, right? Because I think that can be, you know, from everything you're saying about the position you're in now for planning and research and, and running the academy class and all these things, it's because you had a supportive command staff. Not everybody has a supportive command staff, administration staff that that has and fosters an environment like that. So I can see frustration running super high uh, in departments uh, unlike yourself. Yeah, it was it was really a, a blessing. I mean, they so um, my buddy Chris Belanger and I had gotten detailed uh, into training for a couple weeks in the in the summertime to just basically look into the feasibility of doing this academy and to, to you know, write out a, a, a curriculum and, and create a schedule. And I mean, we literally, uh, you know, hold up in a, uh, in a conference room and, you know, put in eight, nine hour days nonstop of just, you know, moving stuff around and looking at different, uh, uh, different departments that had run their own academies sure. recently and seeing how they did it and just kind of orchestrating it all. And we managed to put together, I think, a, a really top-notch uh, itinerary for the and curriculum for the recruits, and then to, to to then see it to come to fruition and was uh, was great. And then to have the the support from from the command staff yeah. to just they 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 saw what we created, you know, they they trusted us to to execute it. And then once we we kind of got the the ball in motion and and things you know were were self-sustaining. They, they literally just stepped back and let us go. Um, you know, once they were satisfied with, with what we, we had in place and, you know, what we had going and, you know, they knew, you know, things were, were being, were being taken care of. They literally just let us go. And, you know, that, I don't think people, you know, this is my, my kind of my message to the, the chiefs out there is that I don't think people realize the impact uh, that showing somebody that level of trust and empowering people to do, you know, what they've been put on this earth to do, uh, how much that means to people and yeah. how, um, and just how motivating that is and the, the power that that has. And to, because again, it, all, all of us that were involved, I mean, can just collectively say that that was was probably one of the, the the greatest experiences is just being able to 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 have that to be given that level of trust and to be supported like that 
um, was just second to none. Yeah. And again, the, the the end result speaks for itself because again, it'd be you just got to realize there's so much talent within within our own organizations that a lot of times it's just the that talent isn't given the opportunity to really shine. That's right. And when, when you set set people up for success and you let them go, it's the sky's the limit. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, Nick. And I, I think that's just the the message of all of this is let your people work. Have trust in your people and your people trust you. And there's this mutual respect for the job that I think propels the job forward, no doubt. For what's sure. what's next for Nick Papa? Outside of outside of New Britain, I mean, what else do we have going on? You doing a lot of teaching, training, you writing another book? What are we doing? So the uh, th- thankfully things had taken a little bit of a lull, so it allowed me to really just kind of settle back in sure. and, you know, uh, just focus on, on New Britain fire. Well, you got and, learning to do. Yeah. 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 So it, it was good. The the schedule had just miraculously uh, lightened up for, for the fall and, and early winter. Okay. It allowed me to just focus on the Academy. And we, uh, th- that was my, my 100% focus was just getting, getting that Academy uh, to the finish line and uh, which was great. And then the, the fringe benefit of being on days was to, I think I got to put my kids to bed more times in the last six awesome. months than I have in their entire lives working shift work. Yeah. So it's been been incredible just to be able to to realign the the home priorities and spend more spend more time with the wife and kids and uh, it's been that that part of it's been incredible. But you well, know, now that it, things are are settled back down, I got you know some travel coming up over the next couple of months and good. you know just. Uh, you know, two, you know, just, you know, two travel gigs a month pretty much for the next couple of months. So it's good. I got some, some awesome, uh, awesome regional conferences that, uh, that'll be hitting up and FDIC, the, the usual. Well, that's exciting. And I, you know, I wanted to say, I wrote down a couple things here, a couple things come to mind, right? Keep pushing yourself because I think when Nick Papa pushes himself, great things come from it. And, uh, I see that right now through this conversation today with you. Um, and the importance of staying uncomfortable, making yourself more uncomfortable and trying something new has, has reaped, uh, dividends for you on the back end, you know, more time with your family, dialing back into the job, finding more time and passion for something new and different. Like it's all exciting stuff too. And I, I think that you have such a great message and, and poise, how you carry yourself. Um, and I think that you are tremendously making an impact on the fire service. And I think that, um, you know, I really enjoy listening to you. And your points of view, because I think um, as dialed in as you are, I think it makes a very big impact. And uh, I just always enjoy talking with you, man. I'm glad things are progressing along for you. It's exciting. And you got a long way to go, man. I mean, you yeah. still, you know? Yeah, this, I, still got a, I still got a long way to go. I, you know, I started my career uh, at a very early age, so I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm blessed, blessed for that. So I got, this is uh, just still scratching the surface. Yeah, something I'm something I'm asking a lot of the guys that come on the on the podcast with me is legacy and how important legacy is, right? The job the job is great. Volunteer career, right? At the end of the day, one day you're going to walk away from it. And I think that, you know, it's it's everything you do leading up to that day you walk out the door leads to the legacy that you've left. And for you 15 and a half years in now with New Britain, you still got probably at least 10 years, I bet. You're going to be a 25-year guy, I'm sure. Right. And and so building legacy, watching those two privates come in and kick you out of the academy so they could teach. And those guys were probies under you, if you will. Like these are things where you're making an impact and mentoring the next generation who then mentors the next generation. When you sit back, what do you want your legacy to be? See, to, to me, it's, it's all about the people. I mean, you hit the nail on the head already by just talking about that. You know, highlighting that that one piece about yeah you know, the guys the guys that I worked with and seeing it come full circle yes was that's it because this everything in, in life is all is all about rich relationships and people I was I'm having this conversation with you from from my uh, my office upstairs and you know it's like uh, as I look around the room and the, you know my you know some of the the memorabilia and some of the things from from my career it's like the, that's just stuff. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day that those, the, the old helmet shields and, you know, the, the badges that it's just stuff, you know, yes, it has a special place in my heart. Um, and it means something to, to me, but it's, it's really, it, it's all about the, the relationships that you build and the, the impact that you're able to have on, on other people. And that's, that's the, the, 
the legacy that you can and hope to have is that when people, you know, when your name comes up, it's like they can say, hey, you know, that, that guy really went the extra mile to, to make sure that I knew my job, that, you know, when, when the chips were down, um, you know, he always, you know, took care of us or, you know, he made sure to, to, uh, you know, to talk me through those, those difficult times. So, you know, if it was a person, a personal thing, or, you know, that's the stuff that matters to me. And, yeah. and that just transcends the, the, in the job into to all aspects of life. And, you know, that's where, you know, that being switching to days has really, you know, kind of just helped me realign everything in my life too, is, you know, just again, putting more, more emphasis on, on home and, um, you know, with uh, my, my, my wife's a saint. I mean, she's put up with so much of, uh, you know, the sh- between the shift work with the sure. overtime and, you know, the travel and the, the long nights of, of writing, trying to get that book done. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot. They, they sacrifice a, a way more than we ever realize sure. and appreciate. So, um, and then just again, realizing, you know, how quickly, you know, the, the your people's careers go, how quickly your kids grow. I mean, uh, my, my, my daughter turned nine uh, on Halloween and my son's about to turn seven in a couple of weeks. Wild. So it's just, yep. they're, they're, they're turning into little people and yeah, you know, it's, it makes you realize how, how quickly this all goes. And, you know, it's it just no, no matter how into the job you have, no matter how much, you know, you, you do for the, for the job, everybody's time is going to come to an end and we all have to realize that. And it's the, the fire service is, is, is a machine. And when you, when you punch your ticket on that last day and walk out the door for the last time, the job's going to keep plugging away. Cause that's what it does. Yeah. You know, it's in the, the only thing you can hope for is that you can, you know, it's that again, the old, the old Dick Scheidt quote of, you know, leaving the job better than you found it. I that's was, right. you know, listening this morning on my way back from, from the firehouse on overtime, I was listening to the, you know, your, the, podcast with Richie Stack and yeah and I, I always love that quote and that's because that's what this is all about and you want to talk about legacy that's all you could hope for is that you left the job a little bit better than you found it and that the people that you worked with you made them better versions of themselves and that's that's all you can can hope for when they when your name pops up at the at the, the at the coffee table in the in the firehouse kitchen yeah you know, however many years down the road they could say hey you know not only was he a good fireman but hey you know he he really took care of the men or, you know, he, you know, he really did what was right. Yeah. And that's, that's really all you could hope for. It's awesome. Very well said, Nick, very well said. And um, as always, man, just uh, an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you so much for joining me today on the episode, man. It goes by quick, but um, it's fun to hear where you are today. It's a little bit different than the last time we spoke. And uh, you know, I can hear it in your voice that you're as excited as you've always been. And, uh, and you got a lot to go. So, very happy to know you, very proud to know you, and call you a brother and friend. So thanks, Nick, for joining me today, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always uh, always good to catch up. And and, to... and and we do share an outside passion outside of the firehouse. We also love uh, the beach. And uh, you and I vacation in the same spot, which is uh, which is always fun to talk about, too. So yeah, we'll be... I, actually, I actually got to, uh, to <laughs> hang out on the, uh, the Jersey Shore again the other week. Oh, uh, nice. But... The, the what exit fools had me yeah. down for, uh, oh, that's right that's for right a, a, yeah for an on tap event you know uh, jimmy ogle and john yeah, sure. and, and the fellas from what exit fools had brought uh, had me down and got to do a little event at the the reef and barrel so that nice. was that was great and i got to the next morning got to have my my coffee on the beach in belmar so nice. it, uh, you know wearing a t-shirt and in February. I mean, you can't get any better than that. Crazy weather, man. It's going to be in the 60s again all week in New Jersey. So, you know. You... This is my kind of weather. Yeah. I'm a, New Eng- I'm a New Englander, but I'll, I'll take this any day of the week. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Well, thanks again, Nick. I appreciate it. Stay right here. I'm just going to sign off the podcast and I'll come right back, okay? Sounds good. Great. Everyone, thanks for tuning in. Another great episode with Captain Nick Papa, 15 and a half years out of the New Britain, Connecticut Fire Department, taking on a new role as he was talking about today. Nick is a dear friend of National Fire Radio and a personal friend of mine and brother, and I appreciate him more than you'll ever know. Uh, Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you have anything you want to ask, uh, any questions or thoughts or ideas, email us, podcast at nationalfireradio.com. We'd love to hear from you. And lastly, like I always say and how I close out the show now, take this conversation, take it back to the firehouse and talk about it because when we talk about the job, we're making the job better. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you at the next one. Jeremy. National Fire Radio. National.
Fire Radio.